Today is Tuesday, August 4th, and uh, we have a quorum. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Council Member Mitchell Farrell, Joe Buscaino. Thank you as well as uh, and Mike Bonnet. Thanks. And thanks for all coming this morning. Um, we're going to start first with uh, general public comment. And uh, so, Mr. Herman, uh, two minutes on general public comment. Thank you, Elf. England Liberation Front. Although I know you're not going to make it in this run for a county supervisor. If you can keep it pert pertinent to this committee. General public comment. Pertinent to this committee. No, I'm going to it's still what pertinent to this committee. No, it's, it's going to be pertinent to this committee. Comment. You're disrupting the no, meeting. No, you're interrupting my Brown Act, right? General public comment for anything you want to speak. Stop you, this clock for a moment, please. The same way you interrupt everyone else. Sir, your clock is stopped, so I'm going to ask you not to speak for a minute. Running. I'm recording it. Look. Okay. It's still running. We'll Don't give you a few more seconds on the clock. What's your if you want to speak in the general public comment at council about anything public. you wish, that's fine. For exactly. this committee, it'll, it'll, it'll pertain to this committee. I want, Mr. Englander. If I could that's ask why the I called city attorney to weigh in on this, and please. I got your attention, sir. Thank you. So the whole issue of my concern is regarding possessing large capacity magazines, which I find, how dare the LAPD find themselves exempt by retired police officers to have possession of large magazine clips. Are we not equal, Mr. Englander? You want to run for county supervisor and offend my rights under the Second Amendment right to bear arms and defend myself against people like you? I realize the fundamental non-fulfillment of harm you bring to this city and to this country, you Nazi. Taking away our rights to protect ourselves in our home and our property, what an asshole. A true asshole deserves criticism, especially when you have hypocrisy on item number 18 and 19, talking about um, handguns. It's not guns that kill people. Don't you get it, Big Ears? It's evil people, a monopoly of mafia organized people who want to have the easy way of life like you and take advantage of our rights. My First Amendment right, the state of California constitutional right, and more so my rights as a disabled person to say, fuck you. I want my rights reserved under the Constitution. That's the reason why the civil rights of justice is going to look into these problems you've created. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, on that, general public comment is concluded. We see I have no other cards for general public comment. Mr. Herman, you can stay right there. You've got several cards filled out, in fact, one on every single item. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take up items 1 through 16. Uh, 1 through 16. And do we have um, any of those special? Find in my college? Uh, four. Four? Mr. Farrell? Good? Okay. So what number are we on? We're going we're gonna, to gonna go ahead and open up uh, 1 through 16. And uh, good. Item 2. Um, instruction from the department on disability to report relative to the statutes of the department emergency planning efforts. You failed at that. As we all heard this weekend about the uh, patron who ended up in uh, San Francisco. From USC to San Francisco. So where was that at? See? We pay for protection for the disabled, and our LAPD can't find a person within a certain time frame. How embarrassing is that? Isn't that embarrassing? I mean, remember, not all persons with a disability are, are visibly disabled. And not that they don't have the ability to go from one place to another, to connect from one network to another in a city. But incidentally, I find that the Department on Disability and the report to the status of referred health and mental health education is not appropriate. You need to look into the comprehensive ideas you create in this city, not the organized stupidity of public utterance or even censorship on this subject 
it can be both effective and appropriate if we do criticize those whose jobs affect the performance of our communities. In such basic objection and my opposition to the handling of your instruction on the Department on Disability, I strongly believe you have to go back and sit on that panel and really put people on there who can satisfy the... Are you listening, Mr. Englander, now? Did he whisper in your ears you got big ears? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back on the subject. Stay on the subject. Well, you distracted me by talking to your, on the subject. to your pony show here. So, again, so you said 1 through 16, sir? I forget. Am I right or wrong? Let me see. Such a long agenda. Oh, item 15. Alcohol. Hey, Herman, why do you always talk about alcohol? Because it's a convenience and necessity that the city of Los Angeles permit and issue permits for the consumption of alcohol, just like the rave they had at the uh, county uh, fair. Isn't that great? Young women in skippy clothing, the kind Englander likes to see. Dirty women. Dirty women like to fool around. But again, the fair, at that fair, drugs and alcohol are the problem. Not that alcohol consumption is not good for you. It can be great because it relieves me of my tension when I go home and have me a glass of wine, a couple of beers, and watch TV. But here it says the Board of Police Commission reports under the operation for a grant award for the amount of $100,000 for alcohol beverage control, ABC, for use of the LAPD to investigate. Why don't you start off investigating the LAPD officers who need your help for their alcohol consumption first? And then second, why don't you go into our communities and find out why we don't want alcohol beverages permits placed at every corner, 10 feet from when I roll out of bed and, and crawl for my next drink. You see, Mr. Englander, it sucks being a councilman when you're not for the people. And when you're trying to run for the Englander Liberation Front for county supervisor, it's a recall. I'm already making the recall on your behalf. You're not speaking on the items. So that's item 15. And the last item was 16, you said, sir? What Board of Police Commissioners report to relevant community uh, policing community development grant? I strongly recommend that there be an audit on these grants on how they are appropriately being spent in our communities. I want a breakdown, itemized breakdown on behalf of the public's interest to see how you come up with such calculations of spending program budget monies to address police bias through our community medi mediation because I don't believe there's fair mediation, especially when I sign up my card as NWA in Compton. You ought to watch the movie, Mr. Englund. You can learn something about racism, biases, and hate towards people who speak against you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Um, with that, the items before us on item four, which was also called special by Council Member Bond, and we're actually going to continue that item in committee. However, it has satisfied public comment. Uh, and so, but we will continue it for the next meeting so we can have EMD to report back. And the remaining items we'll have on the consent calendar. Again, that will be items 1 through 16 with the exception of item 4. Okay, uh, and so moved, seconded, and uh, those will be approved with no other objection. That's unanimous. And council member, for the record, would you like to receive and file items number 1 through 8 and adopt items 9 through 16? Yes, with the exception of with item With the four. exception of number 4. Okay, please. Thank you very much. Okay, and actually, an item one was, was not a receiving file, just for note, it was withdrawn. Wait, wait. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and go to item 17. 
And we've got anybody here on the department on 17? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How about yourself? Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks for reporting back on these. I know these were not a part of the original request in the budget, uh, nor approved in the original budget. So if you can just walk us through. Yes, sir. Uh, these and, and the critical need for them as well. Appreciate it. Uh, this is a critical need. Uh, you just state your name for the record. Wade White, Assistant Chief, Supply and Maintenance Division. And I have uh, Robert Wedlock with me, Fire Prevention Bureau. And what we have here uh, is a critical need in the Fire Prevention Bureau. Um, our light vehicle fleet has uh, uh, degraded uh, significantly over the um, last five years. We focus mainly on our uh, emergency apparatus and our heavy fleet in regards to a replacement and um, our light vehicle fleet has suffered. We have uh, several vehicles that are in the uh, uh, 200,000 mile range, uh, approaching 300,000 miles. Uh, some are uh, approaching 20 years old. So um, <clears throat> in in the interest of sustainability, we've uh, also looked at uh, this funding here to uh, assist us with the purchase of the environmentally friendly vehicles, uh, EV, EV hybrid, to, uh, to uh, accomplish that sustainability. So what we're doing is taking uh, MICLA funding from uh, previous years, some residual that we had uh, from projects, and moving it into, reappropriating it into uh, this project for the Fire Prevention Bureau. This will allow us to purchase about 17 vehicles to accommodate that. Uh, what we've done uh, with our fleet in regards to uh, staying, staying fiscally responsible, as vehicles approach the uh, 200,000 mile range, we've actually taken those vehicles that have significant uh, uh, repairs such as uh, engines, transmissions, or major, major body damage out of the fleet. And um, we have roughly 20 placeholders from vehicles that we've uh, salvaged as a result of that. So this uh, reallocation of funds from previous MICLA year into 15-16 to, to purchase these uh, environmentally friendly vehicles will uh, assist us. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> And we've taken advantage of any of the incentives being offered by the state to purchase these vehicles through um, the Air Resources Board, AQMD incentives. We're uh, primarily funded through MICLA allocations to purchase our vehicles, and that uh, we have to we have to purchase uh, in that respect. So any kind of um, we're going to look into once we purchase these any kind of. Um, uh, incentives such as what you're talking about uh, uh, and apply that to the cost of the vehicles. Very good. Okay. Anything else? Good. No, I have no colleagues. Looks, looks like a good plan to me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And obviously, these are the non-emergency light vehicles. Give us uh, an example. It looks like you have trucks, sedans, uh, of uh, a part of the 17 um, uh, electric vehicle fleet. The non-emergency uh, non vehicles would not have light bars on them. They would not be uh, responding to uh, calls. It'd be a staff car that the uh, Fire Prevention Bureau would go from one um, project to another. Okay, Mr. Bonin, you good? Okay, we will uh, approve this item. But before we approve, do we have a card on 17? No. Fantastic. I don't see a card on 17. Okay, thank you so much. We'll uh, approve item 17. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And council member, for the record, I just want to clarify that number 7 will be adopted, number 8 will be adopted, and number 19 um, the CEO submitted a report and we'll be adopting those recommendations. That will be the order. Thank you. Okay, our next item. We take um, 18. 
Would you like me to read that into the records? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 18 is a city attorney report and ordinance um, to require handguns located in a residence to be kept in a locked container or disabled with a trigger lock. I also want to let people know that Council Member um, Krikorian has submitted a revised report for item number 18. What is this? Are these the same? Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, speaker cards first. Uh, Margot Bennett. Followed by Chad. <coughs> and, and if you all want to come up at the same time, that's that's fine. That would be great. Margo, Chad, Rosemary, Jenkins. I'm so sorry. I was out in the room. That's okay. I was speaking on the Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this is for two minutes, correct? Mr. Correct. Chair. Yes. Oh, you go ahead and you can start can anytime. Start yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Marco Bennett. I'm the executive director of Women Against Excuse Gun Violence, and thank you so much for affording me the opportunity to microphone. speak before you. Can you closer to the microphone? Thank you. Uh, we're all about safe gun storage, and in fact, our talk project, um, which we take out to elementary schools and public health centers and which actually the LA City Council last year endorsed a talk day LA is all about safe gun storage. So it's really with some regret that we saw this um, safe gun storage ordinance just you know in the last couple of hours and we're confused by the language um, for the prohibition. Um, we're confused about what carried on the person of the owner of the handgun or with close pros proximity. I won't continue on. You have the language in front of you. Um, but we are not comfortable with that language and would like an opportunity to hear from someone in the city attorney's office, if at all possible, about that language. Um, I was able just this morning to pull up two pages of many cases where children were killed where the gun was either on the person, on the gun owner, or within proximity as though, you know, the gun was on the person. And so, you know, for us, we're kind of thinking about what this does to really prevent that loaded, unlocked handgun on the nightstand. You know, you're on the bed, you're relaxing, there's that gun. Does it fulfill the, re the prohibition? We're not sure, but if it does, we don't like it. You know, we want people to be responsible gun owners like they say they are, and we believe they are, and truly lock up their guns. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Please, we're not going to um, interrupt the meeting with, with applause or booing or hissing, and uh, thank you very much. We want all the speakers to, they didn't interrupt you during your, your comments. Um, I will now ask uh, Rosemarie Jenkins. Good morning. Too often parents are unwittingly providing guns to their children because of the lack of uh, securing weapons properly. Children kill others or themselves. Wayward teens can go out sometimes for a, a lark or to prove their gangster credentials, they will kill innocent neighborhood bystanders. When I hear someone being shot in the head with no chance of survival, I am shattered. I have been on juries where defendants managed to obtain guns, often at home, and were accused of walk-by or drive-by shootings, and their victims did not have a chance. As Chuck Schumer and his cousin Amy uh, stated only yesterday, dangerous people, including the mentally ill, are still able to get their hands on guns. Basta de hablar. Enough talking. Vamos a hacer esto ahora. Let's do this now. We must no longer delay. Let's approve this ordinance now. A wonderful companion to last week's magazine 
vote. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thanks for coming this morning as well. I appreciate that. And uh, Chad, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Englander, honorable members of the Public Safety Committee, uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak against this issue. My name is Chad Chung, and I am a director of the Calgon Shooting Sports Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to expanding the shooting sports in California through education, community action, and community events. Um, together with our sister site, calguns.net, we represent 130,000 California gun owners. <clears throat> I'm also a resident of the city of Los Angeles, a competitive shooter and marksman, a gun owner, a California DOJ firearm safety instructor, and an NRA certified instructor. In my capacity as a competitive shooter and a firearm instructor, nobody understands safety more than me. I handle, load, and unload a firearm each and every day. To me, it's not a right, it's a way of life. Um, through the years that I've been doing that, nobody has ever been injured by myself nor by my firearms. There is, um, you heard, you've heard previously there were many cases where children got a hold of a firearm and they accidentally shot somebody else. Well, it, as an instructor, there's no such thing as an accident when it involves firearms. There's only negligence. And somebody died because they violated the safety rules. Or somebody broke the law already. There's already a federal law that states that I have to leave my firearms out of the hands of prohibited people. Now, it is, they leave it up to the owner to determine who is a prohibited person and what um, I must do to satisfy that requirement, but there's already a law. There's already a federal law that requires a DOJ firearm safety lock to be sold with every brand new firearm. There's a state law that says private party transfers have to include these locks as well. There's tons and tons of laws already on the books that require these types of safety measures to be in place. Adding one more that could potentially Reduce someone's ability to defend themselves when somebody breaks into their home is just unreasonable. You cannot legislate negligence. You only can educate it. You know, if you want to help people, I suggest you provide free firearms every education with every purchase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pete Repovich. Peter. Peter Repovich. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the dialogue that we've had in the last few days about the whole trigger lock, gun lock issue. Um, we've had a lot of calls to the Protective League from members, retirees, CHP officers that are retired, people around the county concerned about what Los Angeles is doing. So what I'd like to say is that we are in support of the trigger lock issue uh, as amended. Um, we think it's reasonable that we have, that the standard is span to control, that we should be able to control our guns at all times. That's not an issue. What's really important also is, really goes into the high magazine capacity, which I guess we're going to address well, in another. That's going to be the next card. So I want to testify on that too. But as far as this is amended, uh, we're okay with it. We've uh, coordinated with your office and Councilman Kerkorian's office. Uh, but just understand, please, that this issue is big. It's larger than Los Angeles police officers. There's a lot of retirees out there. The federal government has put into place uh, HR 218, which encourages everybody to carry their firearm off duty. There's a reason that they've done that in order to protect the citizens, not only in California, but around the nation. So thank you very much for your time. I'll speak on the next Quick question to the league as well. Um, you said you're in support of it. There are numerous iterations floating around, including one uh, that was delivered on a letterhead from Councilmember Kokorian this morning to the committee. Um, that had Section 830 with an exemption. Then there's another revised that's taking that out. Which one is the league in support of? For We're in support of the one that they did take the 830 exemption out of okay. um, because we felt that the way that it was written covered us basically for the responsibility that we already have. So it does the same thing. It just makes everybody responsible to having uh, control of their weapons at all time. It doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be on you. You just need to be able to control it, which is basically the existing 
policy. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no other speaker cards on 18. I'd like to ask the city attorney as well as Los Angeles Police Department to come forward. And I'd like to open it up to my colleagues first before I speak for any questions or comments. Morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, I actually have the same questions that the uh, representatives from Women Against Gun Violence had, um, specifically about the prohibition section of the latest version of the ordinance. Um, I guess it's 4B. There's, under 4B, there's 1, 2, and 3. It's um, There's an exception that says you could be exempted from the trigger lock requirement if you're carrying the firearm or if it's within close enough proximity that the owner can readily retrieve and use the handgun as if carried on the person. Uh, let me ask about that last one first. Uh, within close enough proximity, what does that mean? Good morning, council members. David Michelson with the Office of the City Attorney. With me, of course, is Deborah Gonzalez. Um, I believe uh, item number three is a more robust version of what Sunnyvale has in its ordinance. It is to allow um, an owner of a handgun to possess the handgun uh, while in their residence, uh, even if it's not on, carried on their persons, um, but uh, in close enough proximity that they can, as the words here show, readily retrieve it. So in essence, within um, probably arm's reach or grabbing reach. I believe that's the intent of three. Again, it is a variation of what was in Sunnyvale, probably a more um, specifically defined and robust version of what Sunnyvale has in its ordinance. Is there a, a clear definition anywhere of, uh, of close proximity? I'm not aware of a specific definition in the code as to close proximity. I think you'd have to read the entire sentence to, to try to glean precisely what is being intended. And again, it's designed to, I think, capture this, not, this concept of it can be readily retrieved um, in the same way as if it was uh, actually carried on the person. So one like foot, it was, yes. Like it was in wingspan almost. W one foot, yes. What about five feet? Um, uh, I don't know whether five feet would be sufficient or not. Ten feet? That might be getting um, too far. It's a, it's a hard thing to know. And what does readily retrieve mean? I think just a, a, the plain use of those words would suggest uh, it is something that they can uh, grasp and reach for and obtain uh, immediately. I would maybe look to LAPD or to my colleague Deborah to see if they have any other thoughts as to. Let, let, let me ask this. I, I could be on my bed and within one foot of me have it on my nightstand and I could fall asleep and uh, a kid could come and grab the gun, couldn't they? That, that is correct, and, and ultimately these are policy decisions, whether to include these exemptions or not. Um, I think the city attorney's position has been historically not to support exemptions, because right. the fewer exemptions, the more um, safely locked guns. Uh, but again, this is an exemption that comes out of Sunnyvale. It is probably arguably better written than Sunnyvale has, um, but I appreciate your questions. Right. Um, yeah, and Ms. Martinez spoke very eloquently at the last meeting about the concern for, for children and representatives of, for women, of gun violence, women against gun violence have, have testified similarly. Um, explain to me, which is why I have that concern, explain to me uh, who, who is allowed to carry on their person, anyone, under the current revision? Uh, Deborah, do you want to tackle that as the owner? I'm sorry. The, well, a anyone would be allowed to carry on their person? The way the, the new proposed language, which is in the Krikorian letter, um, it would be only the owner. That is the way the language but, 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 reads. But any gun owner can carry it on their person. Any gun owner. And in other trigger lock legislation in other jurisdictions, what have they done? It does not use the term owner. It uses person or individual. But it's, it's blanket. It's anybody. Anyone. And, and do we know how many other jurisdictions have legislation similar to this? I, I'm only aware of San Francisco and Sunnyvale. Okay. Those are the two that we looked at. 
right. I, I want to hear a little more dialogue on, on number two, the carry on the person, but um, uh, I would move that we strike uh, item number three, the close proximity and the readily retrieve. I believe Ms. Ms. Martinez is seconding that. Yes, of course. I apologize for being late. It looks like the fly freeway was shut down <laughs> this morning. But um, I concur with Mr. Bond, and I will second that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Martinez, did you want, wish to speak as well? Um, can you give me just a second? Sure, absolutely. Thanks. Mr. Farrell? Yes. I really I want to take the time to and, and acknowledge those who have advocated for um, safe storage of, of handguns as a LAPD officer for many, many years. Um, I've had the unfortunate experience of responding to calls that involved um, accidental shootings. One that strikes me was uh, an incident in San Pedro where uh, two 14-year-old friends had access to a shotgun and one of the kids accidentally um, killed his best friend. However, um, we do live in a society uh, where people want to kill cops. We've seen that across this country most recently. We experienced it with the Dorner case last year in the city of Los Angeles. And we have to really be cognizant of the fact that, you know, our police officers, both um, reserved, retired, um, need to have the accessibility in the event that we have uh, these um, thugs, idiot thugs, who want to target and kill cops, both off-duty um, and as well those who have served at, um, this police department and other depart de departments um, up and down the state. And most importantly, those who volunteer their time as reserve officers in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Farrell, did you have anything? No. Martinez, did you have anything? <clears throat> Do you have anything? Um, thank you, colleagues. A um, couple things. There's um, few people who have no opinion on this issue. Um, people on both sides of it and anybody in the middle. Um, as a, um, I used to call myself a victim of gun violence, a survivor of gun violence uh, in my own family, and I've shared that story many times and what happened. I will say this as well. There is no amount of any possible legislation to preempt stupidity, negligence, and criminal behavior. No matter what we do here today, no matter what this council does, we'll never preempt those three categories in terms of gun safety. Period. Any kind of possible scenario that we can drum up will not prevent stupidity, negligence, or criminal behavior, period. Now, having said that, under the scenario of the gun is next to the bed, the person falls asleep, the kid gets a hold of it, somebody gets shot, great bodily harm, injury, or death, that's a felony. This misdemeanor isn't going to prevent that felony from occurring, unfortunately. It's a felony. You got bigger problems. Um, the spirit in which this is behind this is is um, is from a good place, and I appreciate working with Mr. Kokorian and his passion on this and coming up with what I consider reasonable. And that's all we can really look at is what's reasonable. That's what's extreme on either side because again, we're never going to prevent stupidity, negligence, or criminal behavior. But what's reasonable to the average good citizen? Um, and I'd like the department to weigh in on uh, Mr. Kokorian's language um, as presented. I know he's worked very closely with LAPD and the city attorney's office as it relates to also um, the previous laws that have been tried and tested in the courts. Everything that anybody does in this space as it relates to either gun safety, legislation, um, is challenged. It's almost a guarantee. 
So following closely what we've done, either in other jurisdictions that have already been challenged um, and we already have best cases cited for, um, where we got into the discussion of how many feet is reasonable or not reasonable, um, it's the totality of the circumstances. Circumstances are different, and that's why they go through uh, the, the justice system. And so you can't say with certainty. How many feet are we allowed to actually shoot somebody with a knife if they're attacking you as a police officer? Is there a specific, um, you can do it within one feet, one foot, you can't do it within 12? Depends on the cir circumstances. Um, if you could weigh in on um, the department on what's before us as presented by uh, Council Member Kokorian and the position of the department on this as well. Good morning, Council Members. Uh, Kirk Albanese, uh, Chief of Detectives for the department. Um, you know, the, as you mentioned, Council Member Englander, the department has worked closely with Council Member Kokorian's staff relative to this proposed ordinance. And um, the, the existing language that has been amended uh, what is before us now, the department supports. Uh, the prior language, uh, which had an exemption for 830 for peace officers, no longer has that exemption. And the language uh, number three, within close proximity, uh, the department supports that. And um, the department's interpretation of that is it's uh, the person's responsibility uh, to have control of that weapon. Uh, if you're the owner of a firearm, you have a responsibility to control that deadly weapon. And, and so um, I don't know that you can get into an immediate discussion as to one or three or five feet you are responsible for that weapon. And we certainly expect Los Angeles police officers to be responsible for their firearms. Uh, and so that is part of the training uh, and that is part of the expectation of every Los Angeles police officer. Uh, and of course this ordinance would apply to any, anyone. Um, not only LAPD, but other law enforcement and, and every community member. Uh, and so uh, as it relates to um, the language, uh, the department would not be in support if number three was removed. Okay. Thank you very much. I've got a follow-up question on that one because n number three really makes no sense to me. I'm not in support if, if, if number three is in. Uh, you, you say that... Er that, that there's a responsibility to safely uh, maintain the gun to, to make sure that nobody else has access to it. But th that's an argument against the whole ordinance in the first place. That, that's exactly what we've been hearing from the opponents of the ordinance. I, I don't understand how that is an argument against having a provision or, or keeping out a provision that, that, that says you can have it nearby you in a house where there's kids. So in, in terms of, of the ordinance, uh, it's either on your person or in immediate access to be retrieved by the owner in defense of home, in defense of family. Uh, in terms of, of a law enforcement perspective, which you're asking mine, council member, um, when a, a police officer is asleep for the night, it's not going to be in his waistband under the covers, but it's going to be in immediate proximity uh, in order to defend himself and his family. Uh, and so to have that weapon locked at that time, uh, the department doesn't support that. It defeats the ability to immediately protect family and home. How long does it take to undo the trigger lock? I'm sorry? How long does it take to undo the trigger lock? I would imagine, depending on the trigger lock, it could be done relatively quickly, assuming light, assuming one was uh, awake and, and had the key and, and all of those things. And in the dead of night, if the front door is kicked, those things become compromised and you need immediate access to the weapon. That's our perspective. Yeah, see what gets me is the arguments over number three are the same arguments I hear against the whole ordinance in the first place. That's what my problem is. Um, uh, so, so question for the city attorney. Under the, when this was last discussed in committee, the big question was uh, who's exempted from it, uh, re retired officers, that was a, that was a question. Um, th this is seemingly silent on that. What is, what does this, 
who's exempted from this? So the ordinance is drafted and uh, transmitted by our office did not include an exemption for retired peace officers. Um, there is not a suggestion today before you to include retired peace officers as to this particular uh, ordinance. Our office did submit a confidential report with respect to retired peace officers. Yeah. As to the other ordinance right. before you, the um, large capacity magazine. Okay. Thank and you. the ordinance that was presented to you uh, by our office as requested by City Council was modeled after San Francisco, which does include a retired peace officer, excuse me, which does include a peace officer exemption under 830. The uh, proposed change to that by Councilmember Kokorian um, would remove that exemption uh, uh, but add this, uh, this additional language you see under the prohibition, um, which primarily is uh, new would be number three which again is based on Sunnyvale, but more defined than Sunnyvale. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I still have the concern with number three. To me, it's a, a loophole that sort of undoes the intent of the ordinance for me. Uh, and I think, I, I don't think it's, it's specific enough. Uh, I think folks could argue over proximity. I think folks could argue over readily retrieve. Um, so I have an objection on that one still. Oh, okay, Ms. Martins. Oh, yes, yeah, so. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me a second. But uh, my question was, I guess you sort of answered it, but how did we get to three? Is it based on the Sunnyvale uh, legislation? This was, this three is specifically in that law? Or how did we get to three? I guess uh, my, my concern is this, is, this was added um, recently, and this is not the original ordinance that I looked at um, on the 26th of June. That is correct. The ordinance that was transmitted did not include. So what occurred this language. between then and now? So the difference between then and now, Councilmember Kokorian and I believe LAPD and possibly others are suggesting that council consider adding some additional language uh, similar to what Sunnyvale has in their ordinance. In fact, I've got the Sunnyvale ordinance in my hands. Sunnyvale's ordinance says, except when carried on his or her person or in his or her immediate control and possession. I think the, um, the intent of Councilmember Kokori and others with number three is to expand with maybe a more detailed definition um, as to this concept of immediate control and possession. So it's presented as an alternative to your committee and ultimately council by Councilmember Kokori and I think LAPD and, and others. So is this an alternative to the exemption that some of the folks were seeking? So, uh, is, this to some a extent, I think, is this a compromise? So I think to some extent um, it, it is an alternative. The uh, San Francisco model, which is also what was presented uh, before council, included the exemption for peace officers under penal code section 830. That would be removed um, uh, based on this alternative presented by Councilmember Kokorian uh, with, however, the addition of number three, which again, it, originally flows, I think, from the Sunnyvale ordinance with a more specific definition. And it's a po ultimately here a policy decision for council. Well, initially, when, I, um, when this was in, in um, committee last month, for me, it has to do more um, about protecting kids than anything else. That really is, I mean, I, I'm, I don't own a gun, and uh, no one in my home owns a gun. Um, I certainly know people who do. And... Um, the, the one thing that makes me very uneasy about our gun laws in this country is that I don't think they go to the extent that I like to see to make sure that kids who don't go and purchase a gun, uh, kids who normally don't know how to handle a gun, usually get themselves in trouble because somebody in their home wasn't responsible enough to take care and secure that gun. Um, and so to me, it's always been about that. Um, I think adults have a responsibility if you are going to carry a gun, if you're going to keep a gun in your home, you need to ensure that people who visit your home and live with you um, are far away from it, where they don't get their hands on it and shoot, accidentally shoot anybody or themselves. So to me, it's always been about that. And, and, and quite frankly, initially on the 26th, I thought it was common sense. If you own a gun, lock it up or put a trigger on it, period. I don't believe that coming up with fluffy language um, is going to really protect the very people that I care about in terms of this legislation, which are kids and innocent bystanders who happen to get their hands on a gun in someone's home. So that is where I have, a, I have trouble with how come the language, why this was added um, from a month ago. And um, I don't know what we're doing in terms of the amendment that you introduced uh, last week, Mr. Chair. Um, 
for the exemption on the high capacity magazines, but I had the same concerns here. Um, to me, one too many stories in the paper about kids getting into someone's drawer and, and mishandling a gun and accidentally shooting somebody is one too many stories. Um, you know, I almost feel like we've become numb to these types of stories every time we turn on the news or read the newspaper. Oh, another kid accidentally picked up a gun and shot a three-year-old. Um, or there was a mass shooting in a theater where people happened to be watching a movie. I mean, these kinds of things, um, I mean, I, I personally think we can do more. And I've, I've got the same concerns that Mr. Bonin does. I don't know, what to, I don't know how to separate uh, number three from the rest of the... Um, the ordinance, Mr. Bonin, but I'm happy to work with you on that because I also think this is another way to get around that exemption that I'm very uncomfortable with. That motion was just to delete number three. Okay, so with that and seeing no other questions, um, I want to go back and I want to address that issue real quick again, and I, I can't reiterate it enough. I just don't think any amount of legislation that we could possibly come up with as creative as, as we could possibly be on gun safety will prevent stupidity and negligence or criminal behavior. Um, it's, and I think it was said well, that all the guidelines um, and policies are to lock it and lock up your gun. Um, all of the uh, policies and procedures of LAPD are to do the same, have control. Um, every gun that's sold comes with a mandatory trigger lock and trigger lock mechanism. Um, and they, you know, it's, it's, um, it is those th three things that uh, we can't legislate as stupidity and negligence and criminal behavior. In light of the um, LAPD, as well as the Police Protective League, um, supporting the recent language, I would ask for an I vote on that. We're f we'll first vote on the um, suggested change per Council Member Mike Bonin and seconded by uh, Ms. Martinez, I would ask for a, a no vote as the chair on that, but it's up to all of my colleagues. And then we'll vote on the proposed language from Councilmember Kokorian, supported by LAPD um, as well. So first on the first vote by Councilmember uh, Bonin. Uh, Ms. Martinez? Aye. 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 No. 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 Okay, so that does not pass. And then the second vote on the language proposed by Councilmember Kokorian? As amended or? As, am uh, as amended this morning and presented. Ms. Martinez? I'm still uncomfortable with three. Are, are you going to send this to, com to council, to council today? today? Yes. I'll give it another shot down there, but I'll vote yes. Okay, yes? Yes. 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 Okay, it's unanimous and that passes. I'll go to council. Thank you very much. Okay, with that. As um, a point of clarification, yeah. um, does the City Attorney need to submit a new ordinance, so therefore the item that's in Council today? Um, I believe the answer is yes. Um, if the City Council will be voting on the actual ordinance, or let me ask you this, actually for a point of clarification, since there is a change now and the City Attorney did not draft it, we'll have to instruct the City, this will be a vote from the Council that's today, right. for the request, and then it'll come back, change. then I would suggest that it go back directly to council on this item and not to committee? Right, so procedurally it would show If up there's no other change from council. If there are other changes to council, as, not, as we didn't vote on today, it'll come back to committee. Okay, that'll be the order. So just to clarify, this will be a committee report to request the, the modifications to an ordinance. Correct, and then the council will vote. Draft to, a draft ordinance. Correct, and then the council will vote to instruct the city attorney to draft the ordinance um, as it was voted on today in council and go directly back or in committee and go directly back to council if it changes this is important if it changes at council today it will come back to committee for discussion thank you okay great and we'll take the next item next okay thank you very much okay. item 19 this is on the uh, high capacity uh, margo we have public comment first. That's all. Sorry. I'm sure you'll be back. And would you, Council Member, would you like to reconsider all the items now that the Council Members... Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and reconsider the uh, previous items that were on consent with the exception of item four. Um, so be it. We'll open the roll for reconsideration. Close the roll. And um, there's no objection. So those are items are before us. 
none are special. Um, we already satisfied public comment. Those are all unanimous as well. Thank you very much. Good morning again. <laughs> Good morning. And Rhonda, next. If you want to have a seat, Rhonda, come on up. My name is Marco Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of Women Against Gun Violence. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss a possible exemption to the high cap ban that passed last week and of which we are so appreciative. Um, but we are not appreciative of efforts to immediately start chipping away at what is actually a nationally recognized accomplishment. Um, you have been held up to cheers, including uh, from Vice President Biden, on the success of that high cap magazine ban, the possession of it in LA. So, you know, it's interesting because I'm going to bring up Christopher Dorner. And in so many times, I hear police officers and retired police officers actually use that horrible incident, um, I believe in 2013, um, to justify their use of keeping high cap magazines. But the threat was from a former LAPD officer. It wasn't from the public. And the guns and the high cap magazine that he had were actually purchased while he was an LAPD officer. We just don't believe that there should be exemptions. And we see it as a whittling down of the effectiveness of really a major, um, a major accomplishment for our city. I can give you the names of active police officers who have done illegal things, but I don't feel like I need to. We respect our police, and we appreciate them, but we just don't believe that retired police need high-cap magazines. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, last week, I had the opportunity to speak before the uh, city council in regards to this measure and sharing our personal story, and I appreciate greatly that uh, the City Council voted unanimously uh, to ban the possession of uh, high-capacity ammunition. Um, I, too, was very disturbed to hear, you know, an exemption being presented, um, primarily because there really is no need for any citizen to have high-capacity ammunition to protect themselves. And uh, from, you know, personal experience, I, I had shared, my husband and I became uh, instant activists after this happened to us. And one of the first places we went was to the youth prison. And that's how we have the different pictures that we have to truly show the impact. This is Alec in the ICU when his eye was injured and uh, his lens had to be removed. He had to have a buttonhole cornea transplant, but that was only the beginning of things. We had to give him four different medications at different times of the day that I had to create a chart to determine when to give him which medicine, and this was like torture to him because we had, one of us had to hold him down and the other one of us had to administer the medication, and he would cry vehemently. Ten months old. He's, I believe he's one of the youngest survivors of gun violence from a MAC-90 assault weapon. That should not be. And I just, I, I strongly believe that all of us together need to be in solidarity for this measure to be as is, no exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for coming as well. Suzanne? Suzanne, and followed, followed by um, Dr. Perry Crouch. My name is Suzanne Verge. I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles chapter of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. And I'm pleading with you, please, no exemption for retired uh, peace officers. I, I think it's been spoken. I think they did a good job. But I just want it to be on the record that we are strongly opposed to that. Great. Thank you. 
Good morning. Uh, thank you, my brother and my sister. Um, in the line of duty, I'm all for uh, my peace officers having what they need to have to protect us. But when they retired, uh, I'm not saying take away their nine millimeters, that's enough shots, but those, those excessive rounds, you know what happened with this, this Donner cat running around, and he's trying to, he was really after our captain. And we put ours on the line, and you, you know that, Councilman, we all stood in solidarity that we was going to die for uh, Captain uh, Phil Tangerides because of the good job that he has been doing. They retired. There's no, no need to have that type of high-powered artillery around. They not, you know, they did their duty. I'm not saying that retired peace officers are not allowed to have weapons uh, because they, they earned that right. But that, those magazines, 30, like, like when wartime, that's kind of excessive. And I don't really know the mindset that uh, will uh, proceed. And I have two little babies, and I don't want that type of ammunition on the streets to harm them. Um, and I've all, always been on the right side. My blood, sweat, and tears, as my councilman knows, is out there protecting these kids from senseless gang violence and for people that just want to run around here and, and murder and, and, and harm our community. I'm on the front line all the time. But for that to uh, give them an exemption to carry those when they retired, that's kind of excessive. So I'm asking my friends on the city council not to, to amend that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Peter Repovich, final speaker. Again, uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the dialogue on this issue. It's really important. Everybody has some really important points. It's all about public safety, uh, but that cuts both ways. Our officers, our retired officers, our reserve officers, anybody out there that has formal law enforcement training and lives by the requirements of that training needs to be able to be armed and ready to go. Time and time again, we have seen people saved. The guy that was, I forget the gentleman's name, on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, a few years back that was killed was, uh, the, the suspect was killed by an off-duty officer and an on-duty officer. It just happened to roll up down the street. Um, we want that person to have a 10 bullet capacity, but we don't want them to have a 15. We want to give a Brinks guard, who's not even in law enforcement, a 15 round magazine, and that's okay. I don't understand the logic in that. Really important, HR 218. It's a national federal law that allows people to, re, re, to carry their concealed weapons around the nation, even if, for, you know, if California permitted. Why? Because they want the eyes and ears and the extra firepower out there when something goes wrong. When something happens in a theater, who's the guy that stands up to take the suspect out, preventing other lives from being lost? It's the off-duty or the retired person that's been in law enforcement for 30 years. That's the guy that you want out there to have the high magazine capacity. So I would ask, and I know this has already passed, that the dialogue on this issue continue uh, within council. Obviously, we're working very close with all the council members on this issue, uh, including Councilman Kerkorian and Councilmember Englander. So um, I would say please, on this issue, there's a, it affects a lot of people. You have a, a lot of other agencies that are out there that live within our community. Um, it's a very sophisticated uh, topic. Um, I got a call last night again from the CHP. I got to mind, mind mindful of your time. So I, it's already gone. So thank you very much, guys. It. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the uh, department to come up now. Um, <clears throat> if you can walk us through, um, there's a couple things that have been brought to my attention, first and foremost. I uh, wanted to hear the department's position as it relates to retired officers, um, and, and I also wanted to highlight HR 218 as well. Um, this has been 
an ongoing discussion and dialogue for many, many years. Congress finally passed the legislation that, uh, and for a good reason, I believe, that said all law enforcement within the United States should be able to carry in any state, um, period. And, um, and that's important to recognize. It's also important to recognize something that the state legislature did, supported by both Republicans and Democrats in California recently, which was a, uh, about a 10, a 15 year discussion, which is all reserve officers actually retire with a CCW. And they said, this is a force multiplier. We have, um, it's not about getting guns off the street. It's about protecting the public. These are licensed, trained law enforcement officers for uh, 25, 35, 40 years that have been carrying every single day. The CCW still requires them um, regularly to go in and get tested. Um, and they expire on a regular basis as well that have to be renewed. That has nothing to do with this provision. And I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm just highlighting the fact that it's been recognized um, that we don't have, it's not about the guns on the street, it's about law enforcement. And they are force multipliers. Um, this does relate now, though, to the retired and high capacity. And what that means is, and so if you can weigh in on, on that, and I also understand that in the department's perspective as it relates to retired officers and this exemption. I also understand there, that the department has uh, identified some procedural um, issues with some uh, minor modifications that might be able to be recognized, things that weren't caught um, in the first round of this where it relates to law enforcement, be it full-time, uh, reserve, or otherwise, um, that could is a conflict in, in what was passed last week in terms of some cleanup language, and as well as there may be an MOU or agreements with other entities. Um, and if you can speak to any of those, uh, if there are any suggestions for that, I, I might have one, but I wanted to hear from, from LAPD on that first. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, you know, from the department's perspective, I, I, um, I have to start by saying, as it relates to the comments that we've heard at this table uh, relative to um, the public, uh, to Council Member Martinez, who spoke passionately about um, the safety of children. Um, the department wholeheartedly is as passionate as you are, Council Member, relative to these issues. We really are. I spent my entire life in this business, and there is nothing more important to me than public safety, the safety of our children, and to make sure that we do everything we can as a society to enhance that safety. Hands down, no question. The other side of that is law enforcement, as first responders, is charged with making sure that that public safety is upheld. And in terms of being ready for that, on duty or off duty, uh, that can't be overstated either. Um, Peter Repovich brought up the issue of HR 218. I want to expand upon that just a little bit and, and give a perspective. Uh, when Congress passed that law, they said that all retirees of law enforcement can carry their gun anywhere in America as long as they qualify once a year. Now, it's pretty obvious why they said that. It's clearly a force multiplier. We're recognizing decades of experience on the part of trained professionals to protect the public so that if an event occurs at a mall or a, or a shopping center or a theater, that someone, if not an on-duty law enforcement officer or an off-duty law enforcement officer, a retiree, a reserve, someone can neutralize and provide for public safety. That's important. In the department's opinion, and to the issue of retirees, I don't want to see, nor does the chief of police want to see them limited to 10 rounds, when in fact they may need 15 and they know how to manage that ammo. And they know what to do and they're trained. And they have to qualify uh, every year. And so when you put all that together, I think it's important that we don't tie the hands of those that are here to protect those that we all serve. And, um, and so while I agree with everything that was said at this table in terms of public safety, um, I'm also a staunch advocate of making sure that first responders, to include reserves, to include retirees, uh, are not encumbered uh, in, a, in, a, in a manner that will prohibit them or, or uh, inhibit them from, from performing their duties to the full extent of their training. 
So that, that's your perspective. In terms of, of the retirees specifically, um, in order to become a retiree, you have to serve at least two decades. Uh, most serve three. Uh, these people have qualified uh, all year long for all those years. They are highly proficient. Can we say all year long? How often do they qualify, and is it different types of qualifications? Every other month, they also qualify with the FOSS, which is our simulator. Um, they, they are exposed to, and they have to qualify. It, it's not just get up and shoot. You have to score um, a certain number of points in order to be proficient. And if you're not, you fail to qualify. Dwell on that for one second, if you could, just do a deeper vi dive on that. Are they, they qualify with, um, and is there training? Does muscle memory and training have anything to do with 15 rounds versus 10? What, do they switch off between 10 and 15 throughout no. the year? What, well, walk it, through that and what all that might mean. Different weapon systems have different capacity. A 45 caliber uh, weapon uh, generally has less capacity than a 40 caliber uh, or a 9 millimeter. Uh, the rounds are smaller. Uh, they, the magazines generally hold more at the 9 millimeter category, so it depends on the weapon system. Mm -hmm. The LAPD uses multiple weapon systems. Um, uh, those that are retired are allowed to carry multiple weapon systems, but they have to qualify with those weapon systems. Okay. And, and so um, we believe that the ordinance will create some challenges for us relative to some of our reserves uh, and then the legalities associated with certain levels of reserve. Um, we believe it'll create some uh, challenges for the community. For example, the University of Southern California, they're not peace officers. There are over 100 officers on that campus that carry guns. Um, they go through the LAPD Police Academy. Uh, they carry weapon systems similar to ours and they will be uh, in violation of, of this ordinance. And so that's a challenge. And what category do they fall under? A security personnel. Licensed security? Is it considered licensed, authorized security? California? Everybody has to have a guard card and, and guard uh, card. A permit to, to carry a, a firearm. Mm -hmm. In this case, they carry them on duty. They carry them in uniform. But they're not peace officers. Uh, and, and so the ordinance will create a challenge. That's not to say that the challenge is, is not something that can be addressed, but it will create challenges. And I don't know that the department understands the full breadth of those challenges quite yet. We're still studying. But we also recognize that the council has, has approved that ordinance. We, we understand that. So based on that, and again, colleagues, um, we've approved this last week. These are some cleanup language based on the feedback we've gotten directly from the department. Um, I also recognize we do have a confidential city attorney opinion. It's just that, an opinion. Um, it was um, uh, shared um, from the city attorney um, on their own. Uh, with, I don't believe anybody asked for it, but I've had five opinions from other attorneys as well, as well as from the league's attorney. But having said that, um, we're asking for the amendment to include retired, again, law enforcement, um, uh, in the state of California. And uh, one other one that the department has narrowed in on that's very, very specific, it has to do with item one on, and this is only, as it reads right now, is any government officer, agent, or employee, member of the armed forces of the United States, or peace officer, to the extent that such a person is otherwise authorized to possess a large capacity magazine and does so while acting within the scope of his or her duties. That was voted on and passed unanimously by the City Council last week. Um, in discussions with the Department, as well as the Los Angeles Police Protective League, as well as um, a lot of different opinions from uh, lawyers as well, it's that uh, we missed uh, licensed security officers with guard cards because, again, the USC model who trained through LAPD, that's a real issue. Um, and also striking the, and does so while acting within the scope of his or her duties. We run into an issue of to and from work. We're going to have our own law enforcement LAPD officers um, in various categories, not even be able to carry to and from work. It creates an issue. Again, we're not trying to penalize and narrow in and go after an officer, a licensed security with a guard card who's been trained through LAPD and other um, academies. Uh, it's, very, it's, a, it's a minor change on, on item one. I know the bigger discussion is on the retired officers, which I support, 
But first, I'd like to ask for an, um, a second on the change to, to strike and does so while acting within the scope of his or her duty, because we need off-duty officers that do carry and, and, and most have 24-hour status as well. Uh, and the exemption for the licensed security with guard cards, and it's been seconded. So I'd like to open it up for discussion on the bigger picture and on all the other uh, items, and particularly on uh, uh, what was before us as well as it pertains to um, the retirees. And, and, and just let uh, my colleagues know as well in terms of procedurally that this discussion will go to the council today as well and simply ask the city attorney to redraft these changes to come back to this committee. So it's not, and what has already been passed by the council is already in effect um, when it does take effect. So just wanted to be mindful of that. It's simply for discussion purposes and there's going to be opportunity to look at language and weigh in on it as well as this um, progresses. So I'd like to open it up, Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chief Olinis, uh, thanks for your world of experience on all of these matters. Um, it's much, much appreciated. I have a question for you in, in relation to retired officers and the certification piece. Uh, what, what standard are, are they held to exactly as far as a retired officer? They're issued a uh, concealed weapon, a carry concealed weapon um, by the chief of police uh, upon uh, a retirement in good standing. Um, so assuming that there are no disciplinary issues that would prohibit them in, in the eyes of the department, uh, because the department's reputation rides on, on the chief signing that. Uh, they're required to qualify. Um, uh, there's different qualification. If they want to um, be able to take their gun anywhere in the nation, they're required to qualify per H.R. 218 once annually. Um, we have a special qualification at the LAPD set up every August for that, where retirees come in to our range and we accommodate them and, and they qualify with our range instructor, instructors. Um, uh, and they are required to renew uh, their uh, concealed weapon every five years uh, by department standard. Um, does that answer your question, Council Member? Yes. Uh, to your knowledge, what percentage of retired officers abide by the national standard and, um, up and keep their right to bear arms publicly in, in a national setting? About what percentage of LAPD retired officers or in that category? You know, it's a, it's a good know. question, Council Member, and I can't give you an exact answer. I, I will say this a, a bit anecdotally, um, that the number of retirees that wanted to qualify was so significant that we set up a qualification month for them. So it's August, um, because the department was, we, we don't mix, we don't put retirees out there with, with, um, with our active, because the qualification standards are, are different. Um, and so we created a time for them in order to accommodate the volume of people that we see. And of course, we're a large department. We retire a lot of people. So while I can't give an exact answer now, I certainly would be happy to get back to you uh, with some numbers if, if you would like me to do so. It would just be interesting to, to know. And lastly, so as far as what they must abide by is every five years to recertify their concealed weapon permit. Is That's that correct, correct, Council Member. That's the one requirement that they must abide by, and it's every five years. They must abide by that, or it, it, it uh, expires. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I can ask questions in Council. Okay. Colleagues? Okay, so I ask for an I vote um, with those suggestions to go to Council, then to go to the City Attorney to draft, and then that will come back to this committee as well. Um, I vote no. No? No. No? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, so that passes. It's three to two. And uh, that concludes item 19 as well. And seeing no other items on the agenda, we are well, we, Council Councilman, we do have um, a modification requested from the CAO that um, item number 14 has um, a change to recommendation F to the amount to be $2,868,773.42 to the overtime sworn, and they just wanted to clarify that number 13, they wanted to adopt the CAO Rex. Okay, that's a, that, then that's approved uh, as, as amended. That was not. And now we are adjourned officially. Great, thank you.